Good morning, Lilydale Church. It's a good morning. All right, good morning. It's good to see you all, band. Thank you. This was beautiful, lovely, lovely way to start the Sabbath with some just strong, beautiful worship music. So thank you very much, everyone who's participated there. Got a question for you, a bit of a random one to kick off this morning. Who likes talkback radio? Uh, so it's a dying thing, right? Who remembers sitting in the car with mum and dad and having to endure talkback radio? Yeah, I think it's a lot more of us. That was me growing up, and I remember as a kid driving around after school and listening to Darren Hinch. Anybody ever listen to Darren Hinch and all of his super strong views? I actually grew to find it quite entertaining. Um, but yeah, I, there's something I like about talkback radio shows. And it is these guys, these, these people, like, you know, Neil Mitchell and the like, they, um, they have a way of when they communicate, they have a way of making you feel like you've been taken advantage of, right? Whether it's the government or, or whether it's some Ponzi scheme going on, they have a, a way of getting into the scoop of the day and they have a way of exposing it like nobody else does and they'll call that premier, they'll call that local minister and they will give them a piece of their mind and you're like, yeah, you give it to them. Uh, yeah, and it's just, I always found this really interesting because I was always, I grew up to be taught to be very respectful and you know, to, to, to use your manners and these guys, they had no regard for whoever it is they're talking to and they'll just say it like it is. But the thing I, I, I was thinking about talk uh, show hosts, they're kind of a dying breed because now we listen to podcasts and that's how we get our information. But it was a part of my childhood I really, really enjoyed. But the thing that I, I really want to draw out in this experience was that these guys had a way of putting the spotlight on people or circumstances or situations where people were taking being taken advantage of. I actually was thinking of opening this message up this morning by sharing moments in my life where I feel like I've been taken advantage of, but I didn't want to go there. Perhaps it's a little bit too personal. But perhaps when we all look back in our lives at one point or another, whether it's in the workplace um, or otherwise in the sports club or wherever you find yourselves, maybe at one point or another you find that perhaps you've been taken advantage of. And the worst place, I'm going to be honest here, but the worst place to feel like you've been taken advantage of is in church, yeah? Nobody loves that feeling. It's the worst because you're here. We're all volunteering. We're here to, to push the kingdom and its values forward. And, you know, when somebody takes advantage of you in a spiritual setting, it just feels really low. It's just not cool. And when we read the letter of Galatians, which is where we are today, this is what you need to understand about these people. They had been taken advantage of. So if you want to get into the mindset of the book of Galatians, you need to understand that this is a group of people who'd been taken advantage of. That's how you best sort of, uh, you know, identify with what Paul is trying to teach them. They did a really great introduction last week, just opening up the word and introducing us to the book of Galatians. Um, but I did some more digging around myself, and just a little random fact, this is um, when I was a kid, I remember in church being taught to use your sanctified imagination. When you read the Bible, try and fill it out with pictures and details to sort of make the story come alive off the page. Now, there's this really interesting little detail about Galatia, the area, which is in modern-day Turkey. You see, Galatia was the Greek word for Gaul, okay, G-A-U-L. How many of you guys growing up read Asterix and Oblix? Oh, good on you kids. I love me some uh, Asterix and Oblix. Now, if you know Asterix and Oblix, there are some famous Frenchmen. They're actually from Gaul. They're French people from the Roman era. And there was a part of the world called Gaul, which is modern day France. But Galatia is also named Gaul, but just in Greek. So you have these two places. And, and the history seems to indicate to us that we had a group of people from Gaul who are a little bit like Vikings and they, they sort of pillaged and fought their way uh, eastward until they found themselves in Turkey. And they three tribes set up what was now Galatia. They were sort of muscle for hire. 
But one of the really interesting details, the historical details about these people, these uh, Gaelic people is actually what they were, um, was that in most historians, when they describe the physical features of a Gaelic person, they would say they were very fair, blue-eyed, and had red hair. Very important feature. And so when I'm reading this, I sort of, I just sort of imagine Paul talking to people who not just culturally were different, but just looked so different from who he was. And um, I was sort of teasing my wife about him, like there's hope for the red-headed people in the kingdom of heaven. Um, <laughs> she didn't find that particularly funny. But it, it just sort of helped me fill out. But, you know, I really think it would have been such a contrast. You know, Paul is the apostle who's been called to the Gentiles. And I think the Galatians really were an example of just how chalk and cheese Jews were, not just in culture, but also in their physical appearance. Now, Paul has built a very special relationship with these Galatians, okay? Uh, in part of his letter to them, he says, working with you and, and bringing Jesus to you, uh, from my end, it was kind of like going through a labor process. And you, you, know, you have to understand in that first century, the odds of your child surviving childbirth were much lower than they are today. So when Paul says this, he's like, I recognize that this might have gone one of two ways. But you know what? When I came to you, you were so filled with joy, you even received me like an angel from God. And he just has these really positive memories. You have to understand, Paul goes all over the Roman Empire, and more often than not, he's not treated very well. So he has a special place in his heart for these Galatians. But as we saw last week in Faye's wonderful introduction, Faye, I listened to that twice this week. That's how good it was. I found myself listening to it twice, but you know, we have these people, these Jewish men and women, and they, they come along, probably most likely Jewish men, and they start to add onto the teachings of Jesus. And Faye appropriately put it, when you eat, whenever we add onto the teachings of Jesus, we really wanna take a step back and ask ourselves, what's going on here? Pay close, close attention, because anything other than Jesus probably isn't going to work as far as your spiritual relationship with God is concerned. And so last week, Faye laid this beautiful foundation that Paul appeals to these Galatians who have been sold, go back into ancient Judaism, go back into traditions, go back into the rituals. And, and, and Paul says, you know what, you guys, I, I laid this beautiful foundation of freedom for you. You guys had escaped the, the slavery of your old way of think, thinking, your pagan way of thinking. And now you're going back into this old system of Judaism. Guys, it's, it's pretty much the same deal. It's just paganism repackaged. And that's kind of bluntly putting it. And Paul, Faith said this again. I'm just going to paint the picture for those of you who weren't here. Paul's tone is not happy, chappy over here. He, he comes, like Faye said, with his gloves on, ready to fight. And so Faye really laid this important foundation for all of us that when we encounter the person of Jesus, we need to understand that Jesus comes to set us free. He comes to set us free from our old way of life, from, from our old way of thinking. But the question I want to speak into today is to what end? To what end? Does Jesus provide us freedom? What is the purpose of our freedom? What is he trying to accomplish as he provides that foundation of freedom for us? To understand, we're going to sort of look at chapter 5 in light of Paul's greetings to the Galatians. Paul in chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, has three purposes in writing his letter. This is what he says. Grace and peace to you, from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's purpose number one for, writing, uh, for why God has entered into the world of the Galatians. He's given uh, himself for our sins. Grace and peace to you guys. Jesus Christ has lived and died for you. We get that. We understand that. What I really want to look into is this second idea that he shares. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that 
Jesus came and died so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. And I want to look at chapter 5 in light of Paul's understanding of what is this present evil age? What is it all about? What does this have to do with us and freedom? The section uh, that we're going to be looking at this morning is chapter 5. So if you want to follow along, I'm going to ask you now to just open up your Bibles to, those, to that part of your, uh, your Bible, Galatians chapter 5. And I'm just going to say a quick prayer as we, as we dig into the Word, if you don't mind. Father in heaven, Lord, Galatians, it's such a beautiful chapter, it's a book, sorry, I should say. It's a book filled with practical ideas on how we can use the freedom Jesus has given to us. And Jesus, when I look back at my life, I can see that there have been moments where I've struggled to understand what am I supposed to be doing with the freedom that you gave me at the cross. I pray, Father, that you'd speak through me and the words that I share would speak to someone in this room and at home online today. This is my prayer. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and this room is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're going to be walking through chapter 5 and we're going to go from chapter 5, verse 16. We're just going to walk verse by verse because there is a lot to unpack. I, I spent so much time preparing this because Faye went up to about chapter 4 and then I went, I looked at the rest, and I'm like, man, there is so much. And Emma's like, Ryan, I think you're just going to have to focus on one thing. There's just too much to cover. So we're going to go from verse 16 of chapter 5. And here's what Paul says to the Galatians. And I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So he's inviting the Galatians now to consider how they can have a successful Christian walk other than relying on works, other than relying on what Moses taught. And what Moses taught was important for a time, but they're going back to it like it has value. And Paul says, it has no value. Where there is value is walking by the Holy Spirit. You're not slaves anymore. When you are a slave, it's a matter of giving in to your flesh, giving in to the desires of your body and its inclinations, its proclivities, what you, what you want to do. That's what slavery is all about. But freedom, friends, according to Paul, comes when we give in to the Holy Spirit, when we yield ourselves to the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, I just have to add a little caveat. This is probably Christianity 101. Probably all of us are familiar with this, but... As I journeyed through it, I just found that God is saying, Ryan, I want you to remember this stuff. Sometimes you just, we focused on all these other really important aspects of theology, but Paul is laying down some bedrock theology today. And so freedom comes when we yield ourselves, when we give ourselves over to the influence of the Holy Spirit, not our own personal influence. When Paul says walk by the Spirit, this idea of walking in the Greek conjures this idea of a daily experience. Walk, do, this is a daily thing you need to be doing. Paul is saying if you're going to successfully be a Christian, this is a daily process. How is your process with Jesus? What does that look like? Has it been a daily process? Or do you find that you are a once a week Christians. You're a seventh day Adventist. You come to the church one day out of sevens, or are you an everyday Adventist? What has your experience with Jesus been like to this point? Something I've always been stuck on, and I wanted to share with you just some of my thinking as I've been growing up in the Adventist church. Something I've always struggled with is the idea of what comes first. Is it the chicken or is it the egg? And in this case, my chicken and egg are, who is engaging in this process first of my spirituality? Is this Ryan taking the first step? Is this Ryan trying to do things? Well, if I understand Paul so far in Galatians, when Ryan tries a bit too hard, that's not exactly right. So then is it the Holy Spirit? Is, am I waiting for the Holy Spirit to come engage me? And what you really see in this verse, friends, is Paul saying it's both. Ryan needs to come to the table because the Holy Spirit's already there. And when Ryan shows up in a state prepared to be humbled and learn from God, 
then the Holy Spirit will do His work. And that's all I have to do in this process of my salvation. It's just show up to the table. I, I always thought, well, is, it, is it keeping the Sabbath? Is it doing all of these things? Faye pointed them out last week. And sometimes I think as Adventists, when we forget, it's the Holy Spirit working in me, and I just have to show up. I have to just be present. Let's continue. Verse 17, for the flesh desires against the Spirit. It's a bit of old English here, but what's, what, what Paul is saying is, your flesh is kind of at war with the Holy Spirit inside of you, the Holy Spirit working within you. And the Spirit desires against the flesh. There is this kind of a battle that's taking place. You know, you, you, you give your flesh an inch and it will take a mile. Am I right? How many of you have noticed that just that little moment when you don't focus on Jesus everything starts to go sideways. You start going back to those old habits. You start doing those things, saying those things, being that person you thought, you know what, when I, when I met Jesus, I thought all of that was behind me. The reality is, friend, Paul is saying, as long as you're here, as long as you breathe until Jesus has come, there's gonna be a battle raging on inside of you. And I don't wanna be pessimistic because this is some good news that's coming, okay? But this is just the reality of what it means to be a human and a Christian, a follower of Jesus today. Galatians 1 verses 3 and 4, I said we wanted to look at this chapter in light of that introduction where Paul says, grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. Faye really drew that out last week. Today, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. What is this present evil age? What does this have to do with my journey? What does this have to do with this battle that rages on inside of me? I had to do a little bit of homework. I'm sort of aware of this, but it was just good to really study it out this week. And I have a quote that I want to share with you. This is from a Messianic Jew who really tries to unpack what this idea means for Jewish people today. Remember, we're, we're trying to understand Paul has, and how he understood God. And so Paul's talking this language. So what is the present evil age? The present evil age is the focus of God's purpose of salvation. This is God's focus for the human race. It's because there is a present evil age. Classical Jewish thought was very apocalyptic. And it presented two ages in which there was a present sinful age, an age of decaying, and it is placed in juxtaposition with a future age of blessing and peace. Think to these like these, these prophetic you know, verses of like that Isaiah speaks of like there's this desert, and out of the desert will you know there's a river flowing from the sanctuary, and out comes life. These are the ideas that are encapsulated in this present evil age and moving into a future age of peace. For the Apostle Paul, Yeshua's death, Jesus' death, and resurrection accentuated the traditional Jewish concept. Jesus' Jesus's life really leans into this whole picture. The Christian is viewed as living in a pronounced tension between what no longer is and what is yet to come. The Christian, you see, lives, Jesus has come, he's died, he's resurrected, but the reality is we still live in a broken world. And the Christian is looking forward to that times where everything is going to be right. But we live in that tension, the no longer and what is yet to come. The coming of the Messiah has placed former requirements such as circumcision, food laws, and feast days in a totally new perspective. The Messiah has rescued believers from this present evil age through justification by faith and the outpouring of His Spirit in the lives of those believers. This is not a theory, but an accomplished fact. And I put that in bold in my notes. This has happened. This is a reality. Jesus has come and done all of these things. Take it to the bank. Believers are warned, though, not to be drawn back into a yoke of slavery, Galatians 5 verse 1. Even though the Messiah has rescued and delivered believers from this present evil age, here's the, here's the tension, guys, 
He has not taken them out of it. He's rescued us. We can stand tall. We're no longer slaves, but we're still living in this world. So the believer finds themselves in the present evil age, but not of it. You can look at John 17 for more details. Therefore, liberation must not degenerate into license, nor the gift of the Spirit be abused by selfish, carnal behavior. So he's saying we just can't, just because Jesus set us free, we can't just now and do whatever we want, as that would once again lead us back into the present evil age. I don't know about you, but this was a really interesting picture for, for Seventh-day Adventists, and I know some of you aren't, so often the way we frame the, the, the great story of the Bible is by looking at it in terms of the idea of the great controversy. And I'm not refuting that. But it's really interesting to see how the Jewish mind saw salvation history working. And it, it's kind of in similar but slightly different terms. And so we continue in verse 17. For these are opposed to one another. This is our flesh and the spirit working inside of us. So ultimately that you cannot do what you desire. And I had to do a double take on this. I'm like, Paul, are you saying it's just never going to work out? Are you saying that it's just, I mean, Ryan's always going to be stuck with his sin? He's just going to have to drag that thing around like a ball and chain? And as I started to unpack, I, I think what Paul's really trying to say is as long as we're in this present evil age, our, our true and deepest desires to be completely rid of sin and its influences of death in our lives, it's just never going to happen until Jesus comes. Isn't that ultimately what the Christian desires? To just be rid of all of these, these bad things. Until Jesus has come, that is the reality Paul is leaving us with. In verse 18 and 19, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, and they are, and I'm, and I'm just going to put dot, dot, dot. You can have a read. But Paul goes on to describe when we live in the flesh, when we, when we don't lean into what Jesus has done in our lives, when we don't walk with him daily, he lists out a whole lot of different sins that the Galatians were engaging with. And I sort of summarize them. Three of the sins were of a sexual nature. There was idolatry that was listed, but the biggest standout was social sins, sins against another person, and there are eight listed there. There are also sins of excess like drunkenness. And what I see Paul doing here is he's trying to tell the Galatians, if you go back to this way of, of, of works, of doing all of these mosaic things, God's not going to be able to help you. And ultimately, all of these sins, when you try and unpack them, when you try and understand what they're saying, these are sins that break relationships. These are sins that break a church. Emma was sharing a conversation she had with Zanita last yesterday. She was just doing Zanita's hair for a wedding. Apparently, you looked very beautiful. I said, you didn't take a photo? Uh, Woody, I know you've got some. I'm going to check them out later. But Zanita and Emma were talking. Zanita says, you know what? What I love about Lilydale Church is that, you know, we just, people get on with each other. It's nice. And I was like, you know what? That is nice. It is really good that we all get on with each other, Right? But Paul's saying if we let our flesh take over, then all of these things creep in and all of those things will start to divide us. And that's what was happening to the Galatians as they started to embrace this old way of doing life. As they started to work at doing things the right way, they had the best of intentions. It was ultimately leading down, down a wrong path. Paul juxtaposes this idea of all of these things that, that we will get, that we will just naturally inherit. He juxtaposes these ideas with our fruit of the Spirit. In verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, and I, I can sing it out. Where's Jethro? I, can, I know it if I sing it out. You know, like, what's all, all the letters of the alphabet, Harry? I'm like, A, B, C, D. I have to sing it out, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh, oh. That's it. Control. Oh, oh. That's how you remember, right? Uh, uh, by the way, Tanya Pasco, thank you for helping me learn this. When I was a chaplain at Edinburgh College, we spent a whole year learning this song. 
And our kids knew what the fruit of the Spirit was. There was no way they would not know what this was by the end of the year. And it was really a good education for me because I'm teaching kids who are 12 to 4, but it really just on a simple level enforced these values in my own life. And I don't want to just, I really don't want to break down what each of these values are because as I looked at my commentaries and I looked at the Greek, they really are exactly what they say they are. There's no hidden meaning in the Greek. There is no, love is actually really this when you break it down. No, love is love. When the fruit of the Spirit's in your life, you will just be a loving person. When the fruit of the Spirit's in your life, you will just be kind and gentle. And, you know, Paul uses these two lists to just help you see what's going on in your life. It's just a very simple tool to see who's leading my life. And if, and I always bring it back to this, but if, if Ryan's character on the East Link as he's driving home from Lilydale Church is anything to go by, then the Spirit needs some more work to do in my life. You know, patience is not always at the top. Kindness is not always there when somebody cuts me off and I'm going to church. I'm like, I'm, don't you know I'm going to church? Like, <laughs> you know, we, and it's a very practical list that Paul gives us to just reflect Nothing too difficult, nothing to really pass here. What is your life being characterized by? Now, the interesting thing here, the one thing I do want to point out in the Greek is that when Paul talks about these these qualities, he describes them as fruit. Not fruits, but singular fruit. And that's very significant. Because what Paul is trying to say is you can't isolate these things and go, Ryan, you're struggling with patience. Let's just work on that thing. Ryan, you're struggling with self-control. Just work on that thing. Paul is saying, Ryan, you're struggling. Come to Jesus and let him just renew you from the inside out in your complete entirety. It's a one-for-all package, which is really cool. I like to think it of like a, a happy meal. You get all the bits and pieces, right? You get the toy and the chips and the apples, because we're healthy, right? Uh, <laughs> but it, it's, just, it's a one-for-all kind of a thing here. And maybe if there's been a problem in your life or my life is that we've tried to isolate these qualities and work on them individually. Paul says, no, 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 that's not the way. Here's what one theologian said about this. These fruit do not represent qualities of personal behavior which a man can elect or cultivate or appropriate as a part of his character. That's just not how this thing works. Galatians 3 verse 2, Paul explains how we participate, and how these fruit can grow in our lives. And friends, it's just so simple. I felt, I said to Emma, this is just literally like Naaman coming to Elijah saying, what do you want me to do to get rid of my leprosy? Just have a wash in the river a cup seven times. What? Serious? Is that all? This is all you have to do, and I need to you to hear this. This is good news, friends. There is no law, uh, there is, sorry, Galatians 3 verse 2. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. He's asking a rhetorical question, Paul. Did you receive the Holy Spirit into your lives by the works of the law? Is that how they came into your life? Or did you receive the Holy Spirit by hearing with faith? Friends, I cannot emphasize, if you take one thing home today, just remember, I need to hear in faith. The only thing you need to do is just make that decision. I'm showing up. I want to hear from you, Jesus. I want to hear from you in my life. That's all you have to do. And he again says this in verse 5 of Galatians 3. You can check that out for yourself. But friends, that is all you need to do. If you've been struggling with sin, if sin is just running rampant in your life, and with a room this big, statistically, there will be people who are struggling with sin. Paul is saying, all you need to do is show up at the feet of Jesus, lean into his word, lean into his principles, let them wash over you, talk to him about it, let him engage you in a process of renewal. Don't work at it on your own. If you do see that I'm struggling with kindness and this and that, Bring it to Jesus, spend time with him, hear from him, and just invite him to bring change into your life. That's all you have to do. We continue in our passage in verse 23 and 24. 
There is no law against any of these things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. This is the other thing that really stood out in my preparation for this week. We need to bring ourselves to the feet of Jesus, but Paul seems to recognize that in the life of the Galatians, when he brought Jesus to them, he brought them through a process of crucifixion, of dying to themselves. And friends, this is so integral, this is so important, because I want you to think for a moment, I want you to think long and hard. When you look back to the moment you made a decision to follow Jesus, do you remember at some point in that process saying, you know what, I am going to die with Jesus. I identify with his pain, with his suffering, and I choose for Jesus' death, his suffering, all of those things he went through. I choose them for myself. I want to die to this present evil age. Do you remember a process like that in your conversion story? Because if you don't, then perhaps you never fully accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because for Paul, this is some, this is some foundational stuff. And it actually challenged me very deeply. Because I find myself thinking, how often do I go through this process with Jesus of dying to myself in that specific way? Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. This is something Paul experienced in his own life. He died with Jesus and he invites us to do the same. The word crucified in chapter 5 is an active word. It means it's happened to the listener. It's happened to us in, in essence, or it should have. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. When I chose to die to the world, I'm saying, Jesus, come in. Come in, because I, there is so much junk in my life. You need to step into my life in a way that I cannot change it. It is Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul led people into experiences of death. That's what it meant to go on a journey with people. I'm gonna invite the band to come up and I'm gonna share with you a lyrics from a song. Not the song we're singing, the song we're singing is actually really good. But these lyrics to this song just really stood out to me, and I just thought, I have to read this out. The lyrics of this song are called Beneath the Waters. And the singer sings it from the perspective of what it looks like to journey with Jesus into his death. This is my revelation. Christ Jesus crucified. Salvation through repentance at the cross on which he died. Hear my absolution, hear my story of repentance, forgiveness for my sins, and as I sink beneath the waters that Christ was buried in, and here's the gospel, friends, I will rise. I will rise. As Christ was raised to life, and now in him, I live. I was listening to this yesterday, I was picking up fish and chips, and I just started weeping. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I was just... Gee, I feel like I'm getting something, Jesus, that I, maybe, I, I don't know, it's taken such a long time to get, but you've really did this for me. It, it, it sounds silly. I stand a new creation. If you feel like junk, when you identify with the person of Jesus, you are, this is a supernatural thing. You are a new creation, baptized in blood and fire. No fear of condemnation, by faith I'm justified. I rise as you are risen. I want to declare your rule and reign in my life. My life confesses your lordship and it glorifies your name. Your word stands eternal in my life. Your kingdom has no end. Your praise goes on forever and on again. No power can stand against you, Jesus. No curse will assault your throne. No one can steal your glory because it's yours alone. I stand now to sing your praises. I stand now to testify, for I was dead in my sin, and now I rise. Amen. Father of heaven, Lord, we have sang 
of your soon return. We as Seventh-day Adventists, we are meant to look forward to this coming, but I suspect in this room some of us have not been looking forward. Because some of us, when we look at our lives, we see what a mess it is. But Jesus, the song says, the year of Jubilee has come. That one in a 50 year has come where you wipe all the sins away, where you forgive all the debts, and that reality of Jubilee is here to stay. This is the reality for all of us, so long as we choose to identify it with the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, my prayer this morning has an element of appeal to it because I suspect for some of us this morning, when we look back at our lives, we said yes to 28 lists of rules, but maybe we did not say yes to identifying with the suffering of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, right now, I just want to pray that that if there is someone out there online, if there is somebody in this room today who, when they look back at their lives, said, Jesus, I, I didn't go through that process. I just want to give them the opportunity silently right now to say, Jesus, I just want to affirm this aspect of my commitment to you right here, right now, today. Jesus, some people are just beginning on this journey. They've never been even given this opportunity. As we explore the writings of Paul, we can see shining through this appeal for everything Jesus. Jesus all. Jesus is at the foundation of everything we do. And there are people here this morning, I know, who want to begin that journey of knowing and discovering who he is. And Father, may your Holy Spirit be loud right now in their mind. May the flesh just be quieted out of the room. And Father, may you speak so loudly that it just cannot be ignored. I want to pray that person, those people, whoever they are, would feel confident to come up to somebody and share what's going on in their life right now. That they could come to Darren, Faye, myself, any of our elders, our leaders, a friend, and we can help them on that journey of discovering the beautiful person of Jesus. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Paul and his love, his passion for Jesus. We look forward to that day when our faith shall be sight. But until, Father, keep us safe in the faith is my prayer in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Let the church say, amen. Thank you, church, and happy Sabbath.